Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's our pleasure today to have uh, Manik Varma uh, give us a talk on uh, extreme class classification, a new paradigm for ranking and recommendation. Thank you, Manik. Cool. Oh, wait, let me, I, sorry, I have to make the announcement. So uh, for those of you in the, in the, that are watching from, the, from your offices, I'll be monitoring questions on the, on the tablet, so feel free to ask and I'll, I'll relay them to Manik. Thank you. Cool. <clears throat> cool. Okay, good to go. So thanks very much, Ofer. Uh, right, so I'm Manik Varma from Microsoft Research India, and I'll be talking about extreme classification, which might provide a new paradigm for thinking about core problems in machine learning, such as ranking, recommendation, possibly structured output prediction, and so on. Yeah. Now, many of you might not have heard the term extreme classification before, so let me start by uh, giving some context. In classification, the complexity of the learning task has grown from binary classification, where we learn to pick a single item from amongst two labels, to multi-class classification, where we learn to pick an item from amongst L labels, with L being larger than two, to multi-label classification, where we learn to pick the most relevant subset of these L labels. At the same time, the complexity of the learning task has also grown in terms of the number of labels being considered. So we've moved from working with two labels for binary classification, to tens, to hundreds, to thousands of labels for multi-label learning. And if you looked at the state of the art about uh, three years ago, then the largest multi-label learning, data, multi learning data set had about uh, 5,000 labels. So the size of the output space was two to the power 5,000, which was considered to be large. And so it was thought that going beyond that would be very hard. Then two years ago, we exploded the number of labels to 10 million. The application was to build a classifier that could predict the subset of millions of Bing queries that might potentially lead to a click on a new ad or on a new web page. So the input to the algorithm would be an ad, such as this ad for Geico car insurance. And the output of the algorithm was the subset of queries that might lead to a click on the ad, such as cheap car insurance or www.geico.com. Using a tool such as this, an advertiser could figure out most of the queries that might lead to a click on his ad, and he could then go to a search engine such as Bing or Google and say, hey, you know, anytime somebody asks this particular query, please show them this ad, and if the user clicks on the ad, I'll give you a dollar. Now, as you can well imagine from the application, predicting phrases uh, from web pages is a very important problem, both from a commercial and a research perspective. And so many sophisticated NLP techniques have been developed in the literature. However, the way we decided to address the problem was to bypass all these NLP techniques and simply say that we're going to take the top 10 million queries in Bing, treat each of them as a separate label, and learn a uh, multi-label random forest classifier, which I will be referring to as MLRF for the rest of the talk, that will take <clears throat> this ad as a test point extract the uh, like bag of words features from the raw HTML that lies behind this ad, and then simply classify that feature vector into these 10 million uh, labels and, and predict the corresponding uh, queries. So it took us about two years to build MLRF, but when all the results came in and all the performance evaluations was uh, carried out, it turned out that MLRF had a couple of advantages over the state-of-art uh, NLP techniques uh, at that point of time. Rich? Uh, this is Rich. Hi. Um, why don't you view it as a binary classification that goes the other way, that tries to classify? So that was the standard uh, uh, approach to it. And if you want, I'll, I'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. But I, as I was just going to say, one of the big advantages we had as compared to the binary classification problem was that we managed to push coverage from somewhere around 60% to 98%. Um, so coverage is um, the percentage of ads for which an algorithm makes non-trivial recommendations. And um, just to show you over here, right? So if you take the binary classifier approach that Rick, uh, Rich was mentioning, 
what you're essentially going to do is you'll train a binary classifier that's going to have a sliding window. It's going to go over every phrase in this web page and try and predict whether it is a, a, a possible candidate for a bid phrase or not. Right? So what happens is when you actually run this uh, on the uh, page, you're only limited to whatever phrases are there on the page. And uh, that turns out to be a problem in this particular case because all of this beautiful looking text is actually embedded images. Right? Um, and most ads are very text impoverished. So that binary classification approach doesn't work all that well. And if you look at all the predictions that we are making over here, none of them are actually phrases that are present on the web page. Okay? So this was one of the big advantages. We managed to push coverage up from 60 to 98 percent. And the product team really cared a lot about that. So, so there was a big win right over there. The second advantage was that um, even if you focused on just the subset of covered pages, which means the subset of pages ads for which the NLP techniques could actually make predictions, our, <coughs> our predictions were significantly more accurate. So if you measured something such as uh, precision at 10, then MLRF's uh, precision at 10 was about 5% uh, higher. So that was helpful as well. Sorry, by the way, guys, I don't see very well. So if there are any questions, it's good to like shout out or do a hula hoop dance or something. Uh, if you just raise your hands, I'll never see you. <laughs> right. Quick question. Yes. Uh, what, what does might lead to a click mean? Um, so <coughs> it's trying to go beyond relevance in the sense that it's likely that in the past we've seen users ask this query and click on a very similar ad. So that's what that is trying to capture, that if somebody asks this query and you show them this ad, they might click on it. There isn't a more formal definition at the moment. But, but so if you're evaluating how good are these predictions, it's, some, it's a, like a minimum click rate? Oh, I see. Uh, no. So uh, evaluation is something that I'd like to come back to towards the end. At the moment, this was an advertiser facing tool. So the way you or the product group was looking to evaluate it would be how many of your recommendations were actually adopted by the advertiser. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question? Uh, yeah. So maybe I missed something. Um, so on the, uh, the labels on the right hand side, uh, are they, where are they from? Are These are a subset of the top 10 million queries in Bing. Uh, provided by? By, by, by Bing. By Bing? Yeah. You go and look at the Bing logs, you see which of the pop queries are most frequent or most popular or generate the most revenue. You sort those, take the top 10 million, and that's what you train on. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Why 10 million then? Why not? Uh, I mean, did you try different things and that worked well? Yeah, so that covered the bulk of the revenue generating queries. So it, it covered enough for the group to be, uh, the product group to be kind of satisfied. You could have grown larger. We, we Internally, we actually went much larger than that. The returns are not that great, so. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So <clears throat> where I was going with this was that, um, MLRF was published uh, in WWW uh, 2013, so two years ago. And since then, many interesting research questions have arisen in this new area of learning with millions of labels, which we refer to as extreme classification. And I think two of the most interesting questions are related to applications and performance evaluation, which is what someone asked over here. So what I'd like to do is start by discussing applications and then if there's time towards the end of the talk, I'll touch upon performance evaluation. Okay, so <clears throat> 10 million is a really large number. And I think one of the most interesting questions is when or where in the world do we actually have 10 million labels to choose from? So I think there are a couple of applications, high impact applications that do exist at the scale, even though 10 million is very large. And one of them is people. So there are millions of people who are uploading selfies of themselves every day to Facebook. And there are millions of people who are standing in front of Kinect cameras. So we could potentially use all this data to train classifiers to recognize people, and then ask which subset of Facebook users is present in this selfie. 
And this might have important applications in social network analysis, security, surveillance, and so on. Another interesting application could be Wikipedia. So if you browse, uh, if you scroll down to the bottom of any Wikipedia page, you'll find a subset of Wikipedia labels that have been assigned to that page by Wikipedia's editors. Now, the total number of Wikipedia labels has crossed over into the millions today. And wouldn't it be great if we could build a classifier that could take every document, every web page, every tweet, every query, every image, every video, and annotate it with a subset of relevant Wikipedia categories? There would be so many applications that would get enabled if we could do that successfully. So in particular, we can think of building these really massive scale knowledge graphs with um, billions of nodes and millions of properties. Right? You could go and stamp all the pages on the web with, with the set of Wikipedia categories. And now, you know, OK, this person is a VP at Microsoft, or this is a person is an AI researcher, this person was born in 1952. And this might help you in building these massive knowledge graphs. You can also try and use these for text featureization. So just as we do with deep learning, we take a, a deep network and chop off the last layer. And now we use the intermediate representation as features. You could play very similar games over here as well. So we're trying to see whether we can use this for text featureization. But apart from all of these applications, we figured out that what one can also do is go back to core problems in machine learning and reformulate them as extreme classification tasks. In particular, we can think about um, ranking or recommending millions of items and think about whether we can uh, treat that as an extreme classification task. So the way that would work is <clears throat> we can treat each label to be, uh, sorry, each item to be ranked or recommended as a separate label, learn an extreme multi-label classifier, and use it to predict the subset of items that should be recommended to each user. Thinking about ranking or recommendation in this way might have a significant impact in terms of uh, performance in some applications. Okay. Um, and that's similar to what we saw with the um, phrase prediction uh, and NLP techniques uh, that we saw earlier. Okay. So let's get into some technical details about how we can uh, tackle applications such as Wik Wikipedia, or how we might be able to reformulate problems such as recommendation. And our algorithm is going to be called FastXML, which stands for a fast, accurate, and stable tree classifier for extreme multi-label learning. And it was developed jointly with my PhD student at IIT Delhi, Yashoteja Prabhu. Okay. Now, before I get into technical details, let me quickly give you an overview of FastXML so that you know what's coming for the rest of the talk. So it turns out that at this scale, almost all real-world applications will require us to make predictions in milliseconds. Extreme classifiers should therefore have prediction costs, which grow at most logarithmically with the number of categories, or the number of labels. FastXML ensures this by employing a tree-structured architecture and learning very highly balanced trees. The second noteworthy point about FastXML is that its prediction accuracy can be significantly higher as compared to the state of the art by up to 20 to 25% in some cases. FastXML achieves this by optimizing a rank-sensitive loss function known as NDCG, which turns out to be a marked improvement, improvement over traditional tree-growing loss functions, such as the Gini index or entropy or, or the Hamming loss. Finally, FastXML can also be up to 1,000 times faster to train. So two years ago, I needed a large production cluster with uh, almost 1,000 cores in order to train MLRF. Today, I can train FastXML on some of the very same problems on a single core of a standard desktop. And that's thanks to a new optimization technique based on alternating minimization, which comes with provable guarantees. So let's start by considering the first bullet point and seeing how we can architect FastXML so as to make predictions in milliseconds. So the way I'm going to formulate the problem is that there will be a space of users x and a space of items y. And what we'd like to do is learn a multi-label classifier f that is going to take a point in the space of feature, uh, users and map it to a set of points in the space of items. So that when a user comes in, we can simply apply our extreme classifier, see which labels get predicted, and recommend the corresponding items. 
Now, the space of items might be very large, and even if it takes us just one second in order to determine whether to recommend an item or not, it will take us almost 12 days to go through a list of 1 million items, and almost four months to go through a list of 10 million. Extreme classifiers therefore face the daunting challenge of having to reduce prediction time by almost 10 orders of magnitude. So, down, so from four months down to about one millisecond. Some extreme classifiers address this challenge by learning a tree where each child receives only about half of its parents' items. So when a user comes in, he starts off at the root node which contains all the items, but then quickly in logarithmic time traverses the tree and ends up at a leaf node which contains only a few items. And these are the items that are then recommended back to the user. We can also reformulate ranking problems in this fashion and return a ranked list of items to the user by sorting the items according to their probabilities. So this sounds like a reasonable game plan, but for the fact that learning hierarchies is notoriously hard, and any single learn tree would very likely have been suboptimal. FastXML therefore learns an entire ensemble of trees and simply aggregates the individual predictions in order to return a final rank list of items to the user. Okay. So this is the very same architecture that uh, MLRF used two years ago as well. Okay. The only thing that's going to be different today about FastXML is the way that these trees are going to be learned. So let's move on to the second bullet point and see how we can uh, formulate the learning problem so as to make much more accurate predictions. The key technical challenge that we need to address is we need to figure out how to take a node and split it into a left and a right child. Because once we know how to do that, then we can start at the root node of all the trees and keep applying this procedure recursively until all the trees are fully grown. Now, note that our training data comprises historical information about which users liked which items. And even though there might be millions of items to choose from, each user will typically like only a small number of items. It is therefore far more important to pre correctly predict the items that are going to be liked by a user and to ensure they are highly ranked than it is to predict the disliked items. This is our key insight. And FastXML therefore learns to partition a node by optimizing a rank sensitive loss function known as NDCG rather than traditional tree growing loss functions such as the Gini index or the entropy or the Hamming loss because these traditional loss functions don't have any concept of ranking built into them. And they place an equal emphasis on predicting the liked and the disliked items. So let me try and illustrate what's going on. When we start out, all the users will be present in the root node. But what we'll do is we'll quickly partition the users into a left and a right child. And the reason we're going to do that is because a partitioning of users is going to induce not only a clustering over the items, but also a ranking over the items. So if you look at all the users in the left, they all like oranges, pomegranates, and bananas, uh, sorry, grapes. So all of these three items should be clustered together and sent to the left. But bananas should not be sent to the left because nobody likes them there. Furthermore, if we look at all the users on the left, then we see that four like oranges, four like pomegranates, but only two like grapes. So oranges and pomegranates should be ranked higher than grapes. Now there are many different ways in which we can partition users, and each of these different partitions will induce a different ranking over the items. And what we'd like to do is through NDCG, choose that particular partition where each user's items are ranked as highly as possible. So the way we will uh, partition a node is by learning a hyperplane with normal W in the space of user features X, such that W transpose X is less than zero for all the users who've been assigned to the left and greater than zero for all the users who've been assigned to the right. And we learn the sparsest possible hyperplane that optimizes NDCG and show that in the results, this leads to significantly more accurate predictions. But before we get on to the results, let me quickly talk about uh, optimizing NDCG. Um, so there are going to be some formulae flying around. Uh, I, I apologize in advance for that. But you can try and ignore that uh, if you like. I'll explain everything intuitively. Uh, the key take-home message from the next set of slides is 
we have a very efficient way of optimizing NDCG, which will allow us to grow our fast XML trees in minutes. Okay. So coming here and talking about NDCG is like preaching to the choir, right? But there might be one or two of you who don't know NDCG, so please bear with me, uh, the rest of you, while I just explain briefly, and then I'll talk about the optimization. Okay. So it turns out that NDCG is incredibly easy to define. What it does is it measures the quality of a given ranking for a particular user. Okay. It's a number between 0 and 1, and larger values mean better rank rankings. Okay. So the way you compute NDCG or define NDCG is you take your <laughs> ranking, you look at the top ranked item, and if the user likes it, you add a 1 to your score, otherwise you do nothing. And then you move on to the second rank item, and if he likes it, you add a 1 by log 2, otherwise you do nothing. Third item, 1 by log 3 if he likes it, otherwise nothing, and so on and so forth. Okay. So NDCG is incredibly easy to define, but it turns out that it's also really hard to optimize. So you can see that there's a sort function buried here inside NDCG. And this means that not only is NDCG not convex, but it is also not differentiable, which means we can't directly apply any of the large-scale gradient-based uh, techniques that we've developed for efficient optimization. Furthermore, NDCG might behave also might also behave very erratically with respect to the hyperplane that we're trying to learn. So large changes in the hyperplane might have no uh, impact on the induced rankings. And so NDCG will stay flat in large regions of space. But there will also be situations when just a small change in NDCG uh, in the hyperplane will be enough to send a few users from the left to the right. And this will change the induced uh, item rankings. And so NDCG will suddenly jump up. Okay. So NDCG has this nasty property that it's either flat everywhere, which means you don't know which direction to go in if you want to optimize it, or wherever every, anything interesting happens, it's, it's discontinuous. Right? And this is a very well-known uh, loss function in the uh, learning to rank literature. And Ofer and Chris have spent a lot of time optimizing that. In fact, Chris at ICML won, won a test of time award for all the work he's done uh, on optimizing NDCG for the last 10 years. So it turns out, like, based on all this, because NDCG is such a hard function to optimize, there's a very real danger that uh, FastXML might actually be harder to train than MLRF. But it turns out that there's something special we can do over here, which at first is actually going to sound counterintuitive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the problem even more complex by adding in an extra 100 million variables into the optimization. Now, this is going to sound bizarre, but for the fact that each of these extra variables that I'm going to add can be optimized in microseconds. And then the remaining problem that I'll have left will turn out to be a simple binary classification problem in the hyperplane which is our bread and butter task in which we know how to solve very efficiently. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take each user and add an extra variable for him or her, which I'll call delta. And delta can be either minus 1 or plus 1, depending on whether the user has been assigned to the left partition or to the right partition. At the same time, I'll introduce two extra variables, r minus and r plus, for each item. And these will specify the rank of the item on the left and the right child, respectively. And at the top, you can see how I've modified the objective function to uh, bind together the hyperplane normal w to the item ranking variables r minus and r plus to the user partition variables delta. Now, there might be 100 million users and 10 million items. So we'll have added an extra 120 million variables. But here is how we can optimize them very efficiently. So we'll start by <clears throat> simply assigning each of the users to a left or a right uh, partition completely at random. Okay, so there's going to be a random initialization. But because I know which uh, items each user likes, this will induce not only a clustering over the items, but also a ranking over the items on the left and the right. Now you can see that this is not a very good partition because the induced item ranking is not compact. And so NDCG will, will be low. But what we can now do is apply iterations of this alternating minimization procedure where we're first going to freeze the item rankings and then optimize over the user variables and then freeze the user variables and optimize over the item rankings. And we're going to keep doing this until we converge. Okay. So the way we're going to start is we'll freeze the item rankings and now we're going to optimize all the user variables by going to each user in turn 
Let's say we start with this particular user. And we're going to go to each user in turn and ask him, hey, are you better off sticking in your current partition or would you actually like to switch partitions? So if we look at this user, we see he's been assigned to the right partition based on the random initialization. But his items are actually ranked higher on the left than they are on the right. So he would be better off switching partitions. And we can do this for each user in turn and get a repartitioning of the uh, set of users. Now note that each of these, uh, optimizing each delta for the user, can be done in microseconds. Because all you need to do is go and see which items the user liked. That's a couple of table lookups. You see their ranks on the left and their ranks on the right. Compute NDCG, and whichever is higher, you just assign the user there. So this is done in microseconds. The next step in the op optimization is to freeze the uh, user uh, variables and recalculate the item rankings. But again, that's very efficient, right? Because you just need to make one pass over your ratings matrix, see which users have been assigned to the right, and simply see how many votes were there for each item and sort. Okay. So just, just going through the ratings matrix and, and doing a sort. So that can be also done very quickly in microseconds. Okay. And now you can see that this ranking is slightly better than the ranking we started out with, but there's still room for improvement. So we can keep applying iterations of this alternating minimization, uh, first freeze the item rankings and then optimize the user variables, then freeze the users, optimize the item rankings. And we can prove that there will soon come a time where no user will want to switch partitions any further. At which point of time we'll have you uh, converge to a stable partition and a stable ranking. So I'm not going to go into details of that proof. You can come and uh, talk to me afterwards or look at our KDD paper. But essentially, with in a very small number of iterations, you'll have reached here. The only problem that is left now is to separate the users on the left from the users on the right. But that's a simple binary classification problem. And you can learn your, you can use your favorite um, machine learning toolkit, TLC, uh, VW, Azure ML, whatever you like, that will just optimize that L1 log loss objective and learn a binary classifier. Okay? Quick question. So, yes. I miss how the X size encode the users. This is Chris. The X size encode the users. I Mentioned how that works. It's just one of n encoding. Oh, no. So the uh, XIs are the uh, user feature vector, right? So the, his age, his gender, his uh, IP address, uh, whatever else uh, we know about him. So that's his feature vector. And the ratings matrix uh, is a 0, 1 encoding of which items he liked. Okay. So um, this entire, uh, what I wanted to say was that the, this entire operation can be carried out uh, very efficiently. It, optimizing each delta and r takes only microseconds, and this hyperplane can be learned in a matter of seconds. Right? And once we've learned the hyperplane, then we know how to partition a node into a left and a right child. So now we know how to grow the tree, and we can simply start at the top and keep applying the procedure recursively until the entire fast XML tree has been learned in minutes. So let's finally get to some results. We benchmarked FastXML on a bunch of small, medium, and large-scale data sets. The advantage of the small data sets is that they're all publicly available. And we can compare FastXML's performance to a number of techniques that have been proposed in the literature. Of the medium-scale data sets, uh, we tried Wikipedia. So this is the challenge version of Wikipedia. It has about 325,000 labels. Uh, but not many algorithms will scale to it. But it's publicly available. Uh, then the ads data sets are all proprietary to Microsoft. And the largest ads data set has about uh, 70 million training points, 20 million test points, uh, 9 million labels, and 2 million dimensions. Okay. So uh, the results I'm going to show you now are uh, from KDD. Uh, we just learned that our NIPS paper got accepted. So a paper on embeddings got accepted to NIPS. So the complexion of results will change slightly at NIPS. But uh, for now, let's just go with the KDD results. So I'm going to start by showing you uh, results on the small data sets. So here is precision at 1, precision at 3, and precision at 5 of a bunch of algorithms on the small data sets. Now, because these data sets are small, we don't really care about training time. So we decided to focus on prediction accuracy. And we did a very fine sweep over the hyperparameters of all the algorithms except for fast XML. So FastXML also has a few hyperparameters, such as the number of trees or the maximum depth of a tree. But we decided to keep these fixed 
and set them to default values across all data sets, both small and large, because ultimately we will care a lot about FastXML's training time. And I don't want to spend time retraining FastXML again and again and again with different hyperparameter settings when we get to the large data sets. So of course, this gives all the other algorithms a slightly unfair advantage over FastXML, but that's all right, because even with one hand tied behind the back, FastXML can still equal or outperform all the other algorithms that have been published in the literature. So if we start by looking at all the uh, low rank matrix factorization, collaborative filtering, embedding techniques that have been published, starting from the compressed sensing or CS work of uh, John Langford, Sham Kakade, going all the way up to the absolute state of the art in the field, at least until the coming NIPS, which is the LEML algorithm of Inderjeet Dhillon, Pratik Jain, uh, we see that fast XML is much better than these, uh, considerably better. Even if these techniques were taken to their limiting uh, case, and we learned a full rank matrix rather than a low rank matrix, as is done in the one versus all baseline, uh, these models might still not be able to outperform fast XML. Finally, fast XML might be better than other tree based methods uh, as well, particularly um, as compared to MLRF, which is the multi label random forest that we had proposed two years ago, as well as LPSR which is a technique that Jason Weston had proposed when he was still at Google, and which was shown to give lifts in uh, CTR while recommending uh, videos on YouTube. So it would appear that thanks to NDCG, even untuned fast XML can equal or outperform all like highly tuned versions of all the algorithms that have been uh, presented in literature. However, this is not the scale for which fast XML was designed. So if we move to a slightly larger data set, this message gets even more strongly reinforced. Uh, there are a couple of things to notice. The first is that most of the algorithms can no longer scale to Wikipedia uh, if we restrict training to be something reasonable. Let's say uh, up to a, one full day on a standard, uh, single core of a standard desktop. Of the algorithms that do scale, fast XML's top ranked prediction can be significantly more accurate as compared to both LEML and LPSR. So uh, as compared to LEML, there's about a 30% improvement and about 25% as compared to LPSR. The second thing to note is that two years ago, it took me about five hours to train MLRF, but that was on a thousand node cluster on Cosmos. Today, I can train fast XML on Wikipedia in, in so it took me four hours earlier, now it takes me about five hours, but that's on a single core of a standard desktop. And that's thanks to the new uh, um, optimization based on alternating minimization. But again, this is still not the scale at for which FastXML was designed. Uh, if he just wanted to stick at this, at this scale, there are a bunch of other tricks we could have played which would have pushed this up to nearly 60%. So if we move to slightly larger data sets, we see the trend is still the same. So <clears throat> fast XML is more accurate at prediction than both LEML at, and LPSR at the ads 430k data set. And then LEML can no longer scale to the ads 1 million data set. And neither LEML nor LPSR can scale to the ads 9 million data set. And if you notice um, throughout, our prediction time is always either less than 1 millisecond or around 1 millisecond in the largest case. So this thing can actually be uh, used in real world applications if you like. Now, the reason I was fixating on training on a single core is because that's what my student had back home at IIT Delhi. But modern day machines uh, have more than one core. And FastXML can exploit that uh, trivially by parallelizing by growing different trees on different cores. So here is how uh, my training time varies with the number of cores. Uh, you can see that if I have access to 16 cores, then my training time is less than half an hour on both ads 1 million and, and on Wikipedia. And I can train in, uh, on ads 430k in less than five minutes. My training time on ads 9 million is still very large. It takes me about um, 10 hours to train 30 trees and uh, 17 hours to train 50 trees. But that's much better than the two days it was taking me uh, two years ago on a thousand node cluster. However, if there are any experts out there uh, in terms of large scale learning on GPUs, I would love to discuss this more with you and, and, and see if we can speed this up even further. Anik, I have a question. I, I missed something. So what's the difference between two trees? I understand how you really, how you 
grow one tree, but you're growing two trees in parallel. What, how, how are they, just the random initialization is different? Or? The random initialization is different, and then we are using a L1 log loss, so that's not strongly convex. So depending on the initialization, you get different results for that. Okay. Sorry, we tried. Uh, we tried uh, um, uh, randomly sampling the d uh, data points or the features, but that didn't help. That wasn't a very good idea. Okay. Um, is, is there any way to use here something like gradient boosting as opposed to just random forest? Um, maybe uh, it would slow your training down a lot. And I really, really wanted to make training very fast over here. What happened was my cluster got taken away from me, <laughs> right? They said I was contributing too much to global warming. So I said, what's the one thing they can't take away from me, right? It's my desktop. I really, really want to train on one desktop. <laughs> so I was really fixated on making this thing train very quickly. Um, sure, if you had the luxury, you could um, do that. I, I'll get to what appropriate loss functions might be on which you might want to compute the gradient. So actually, that's going to come just next. So let's have that discussion in, in five minutes, if you don't mind. I have a quick question for you. <clears throat> so I understand why it's faster. It's clear. What's your intuition as to why it's more accurate than the other methods? Um, so more accurate as compared to what? If you look at all the um, low rank matrix factorization work that's been um, uh, developed, right? I mean, if you look at recommendation, almost everybody has done collaborative filtering or low rank factorizations. But when you come to this scale, if you look at the ratings matrix, there is just no way it can be low rank. So ha what will happen is you'll have 100 million users. Each of these users in the tail will like two or three items, but there'll be a different two or three items. So there'll be a column like one entry, non-zero, non-zero, non-zero. The next guy will be different three entries, non-zero. Next guy, another different three entries, non-zero. So there's no way any row can be written as a linear combination of the other rows. But even on the small problems, it It's not really that much better. The, when you, the real lift comes here at Wikipedia. And when we went to Wikipedia, and when we looked at the low rank matrix, uh, we, we did a, a SVD and took the top 500 eigenvectors. And we saw that that captured only 10% of the matrix. And 500 is a number that's much larger than what everybody else uses. Everybody else goes between 20 to 50 embedding dimensions because otherwise the computational cost is just too high. Uh, prediction training both, right? So only 10% of the matrix is being captured. So that's what our NIPS paper is about. Uh, we're trying to break free of the low rank assumption and see whether we can do something which has a nonlinear embedding that preserves local distances. And that apparently works much better. So that's the uh, reason for the uh, performance improvement over low rank uh, uh, methods. As compared to other tree-based methods, well, I think we are much better than LPSR because all JSON does is he does k-means and, and clusters the two sets of users and, and goes with that, right? So there's no regard for the loss function there. As compared to MLRF, I think the main reason we're better is because we're not taking single features. And, and learning splits on that. We're learning a full hyperplane. And what was happening uh, with MLRF is that when you have 10 million features, your, uh, or 2 million features, your features become super selective, which means that if you were to take a split on any single feature, then even for the best features, you would have, let's say, 10,000 or 100,000 documents going left, and then the rest of the 100 million going right. So you learn these imbalanced trees, and you don't get very good generalization. You can try and force MLRF to use multiple features or learn balanced trees, and then your training time goes up even further, and then your accuracy uh, in some cases comes down uh, because of the regularizer. So I think that's why uh, uh, this is better. And then NDCG is kind of, you want to do some kind of ranking in any case, that's how you're going to measure performance. Right? These are more like ranking and recommendation tasks. So it turns out to be a better thing to do. The only thing I'm not sure about is, which I would love to get some help from you guys, is I don't know what the objective function should be at the root node, because ultimately the predictions are going to be made by the leaves, right? So if I'm taking something like precision at k, I want to optimize precision at k at the leaves, or I want to optimize NDCG at k for the leaves. But doing that at the root node would be too myopic, right? So if I just wanted to optimize, let's say, NDCG at 5 at the root node, all that would say is, 
what are the five best items on the left and what are the five best items on the right and I don't care about anything else. So if you have Wikipedia where you have let's say half a million uh, items, there's no way that will work well. So we decided to go with NDCG over the entire set of items and one of the things that you pointed out uh, which was very uh, helpful is that ranking over the rest of the tail there's a lot of information over there. So trying to learn a function over the all L items rather than just the top five can help you in any case. So we found that not trying to be too myopic towards the top, looking at ranking all the items rather than just the top K seemed to work well. Sorry, that was a huge monologue. <laughs> um, so the conclusion for uh, this part of the talk, uh, well, there are only take, two take home messages. The first is that extreme classification is a new area in uh, machine learning, which will allow us not only to tackle classification problems at web scale, but which might also allow us to go back to other problems in machine learning and try and uh, reformulate them as extreme classification tasks. Uh, the second take home message is that uh, FastXML is a new algorithm for uh, extreme classification, which can make significantly more accurate predictions as compared to other methods, and which you can train on your desktops. So uh, if you're interested in code, just email me. I'd be very happy to share the code or the data or uh, something else. Money. Anand? Yeah. Hey. Uh, no, if I were to think about what's the one thing you did different from, say, a year ago, is this the alternate minimization? Uh, so um, it's both the objective function. So earlier on, I was trying to optimize Gini index. Uh, now I'm trying to optimize NDCG. And earlier on, I was doing the standard random forest optimization, which is the brute force search and thresholding. And now I'm doing the alternating minimization. Those are the only two changes. And both are important. I'll show you results later on about how that. Uh, so just, just wait for five minutes, and I'll show you those results. Do they both contribute to yes. performance they as both. well as accuracy? Yes. One? Yes. So I'll show you results in five minutes, if you don't mind. Now, so I'm just saying five minutes because I want to just finish off this last portion of the talk where um, what I want to do is go beyond um, discussing the specifics of a particular algorithm and return to the general area of extreme classification. Right? Why did we need to come up with a new area? Why did we need to come up with a new name? Why couldn't we just have done whatever people were doing earlier on? Right? So what I'd like to do is discuss how extreme classification could be different from traditional classification. And um, I think that not only are the scaling and computational aspects different, but I think the statistics are also different. And this is perhaps best highlighted by uh, considering how we might evaluate the performance of an extreme classification algorithm as compared to a standard traditional classification algorithm. So this will go back to the performance evaluation question that somebody asked right at the beginning. So it turns out that a number of loss or gain functions have been um, proposed for evaluating traditional multi-label uh, learners, such as the Hamming loss or the subset 0, 1 loss, or um, Jacquard distance, uh, precision, recall, F-score, and so on and so forth. But I think that these might not directly apply in the extreme uh, setting. So I've made a toy example to convey that. And uh, the US presidential elections are very much in the news, which is why I chose this particular example. So I'm going to give you the Wikipedia pages for five US presidents. And the task is to label each of these pages with five Wikipedia labels. Okay. And I'm showing you the results of three algorithms over here, which attempt this task. Uh, the first algorithm is a constant algorithm which means that no matter what the input is, it's going to output the same list of labels. So it looks at some of the most popular labels on Wikipedia, sorts them by popularity, and just outputs that list. So that's algorithm one. Algorithm two uh, is something that does the opposite of one. Uh, instead of looking at the tail of head, it completely ignores the head and focuses just on the tail. So it's trying to predict these labels that are not uh, very common. Uh, but because this is a very difficult task, it often makes mistakes. And I'm showing that by these dashed lines over here. So I actually put this algorithm because of Leon's uh, keynote at ICML, uh, where he was discussing metrics a lot. And one of the metrics that he was proposing was coverage. Right? So if you look at coverage, uh, I've put this algorithm uh, for him over here. And then the third algorithm is something that is a mix of one and two. Right? Uh, it, it, has some head labels, but then it also has some tail labels. 
So what I'd like to do is just do a quick show of hands. Um, I want to see which uh, algorithms you like. So people who think algorithm one is the best should raise one hand. Uh, people who think algorithm two is better than one and three should raise both hands. And then people who like algorithm three should like two hands and a leg or something. <laughs> Uh, or don't do anything. Hey, Anand, then do a hand count for me, please. See. <laughs> I get four two hands and one one hand and no leg. Four so two hands? Leg, one, <laughs> leg, 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 leg. <laughs> I see. The leg grew hard to see. <laughs> so I think most people would prefer the third algorithm. I can't see well here. Well, here. Yes. Right? Most people, by and large. Sorry? You should do yes and nays next time. Okay. <laughs> That's true. But if you look at all these three algorithms, right? Algorithm one is the one that maximizes uh, precision. So no other algorithm can have higher precision than one. But typically we don't tend to like it very much, right? And I'd, I'd been measuring performance in terms of precision all this while. If you look at algorithm two, this is the one that maximizes coverage. So as I said, coverage is the number of labels or categories, unique labels or categories that you got right. So this has the most number of uh, correct predictions across uh, labels. But many people don't tend to like this as well. Right? Most people tend to like three, but three actually doesn't optimize any of the uh, metrics I'd listed in the previous page. And if you look at why that is the case, then it's very clear why traditional uh, loss functions might not be working so well. So I think one of the reasons is uh, something I've already alluded to, and that depends on the statistics of the positives to the negative labels. So if you look in all of these data sets, on most data points, the average number of positive labels is completely dwarfed by the number of negative labels. So positives means relevant and negatives means irrelevant. In fact, in many cases, you have less than eight uh, positive labels per data point, and then hundreds of thousands or millions of negatives. So traditional loss functions such as the Hamming loss, which place an equal emphasis on predicting the positive and the negative labels, cannot work well uh, in this setting. Now, it turns out that there's also another more subtle reason why loss functions computed on the negative labels don't work that well. And that's because many of the negative labels aren't really negative. Okay? So traditionally, in supervised learning, we've been working in this paradigm where we, we suppose that there exists an expert somewhere out there, an annotator or an expert, who whenever we give him a test point can tell us what are the labels that are relevant to that test point, and so performance evaluation is easy. However, in the extreme setting, there cannot exist an expert or an annotator who can go through a list of 10 million labels and mark out the exact relevant subset. So even if we look at Wikipedia and trust Wikipedia's editors, here's Jeanette's page. Uh, it has some labels. But you can see that many labels are missing, right? So for example, it doesn't mention that she's a VP at Microsoft, that she was a director at DARPA. It has very little to do uh, mention about her research and her contributions there. So there's nothing about type theory and so on. Right? So a loss function, which would penalize you for predicting that uh, type theory is relevant, would actually be not a very good loss function over here. Right? So I think we should try and move away from loss functions that look at both positives and negatives, such as Hamming loss or other loss functions, and work only with those loss functions that focus on the positive labels. But that doesn't solve the entire problem, right? Because of course, those will be still biased. But it will also turn out to be the case that all traditional loss functions that work on just the positives uh, treat each label as being equal. However, that is definitely not the case in the extreme uh, scenario. So if you look at the distribution of labels, there are few labels that have a lot of training data that occur very frequently. And so it's easy to train on those labels. And it's also relatively easy to predict them. However, the vast majority of labels in an extreme scenario occur not very frequently. Okay? In many cases, they occur only once. On some of the data sets so I've, I'm showing you over here, many of the labels occur less than five times. So these data uh, labels, they don't occur very frequently. And they're very hard to train on. And they're extremely difficult to predict correctly. However, in many scenarios, you can get much more reward for predicting these rare labels than the uh, relevant label, than the popular labels. So again, like in Jeanette's web page, the single most popular label on Wikipedia is living person. Right? 
but there's very little information gain in predicting that Jeanette is alive, right? Uh, it's much better to predict from the tail and say, uh, like predict about type theory or a VP at Microsoft, et cetera. And this might not be such a problem if all we had to do was predict uh, all the positive labels, right? Then, then it's fine. You just predict all of them and you're done. But in many cases, the number of slots that we have available for prediction is limited. So in particular, if you wanted to do recommendation, then you might have only five slots uh, on your ads page or only five slots on your Amazon page. And you want to figure out what are the five best labels I, sh I should show. And particularly in recommendation, Recommending items that are popular and common and that you might already know about might not be very helpful. What will, be, what will work the best is, is recommending these rare labels that really delight and surprise you. Right? I had no idea this existed, but it's relevant to me. It's perfect for what I want. And thank you very much for that recommendation. So I think if we were to design a loss function for the extreme scale, we would need to focus, uh, of course, on accuracy. Right? But we should do this in an unbiased way. We should try and come up with loss functions which, as your test set becomes uh, larger and larger, the value that you compute for your metric should converge to the value of the metric had it been computed on the full uh, observed ground truth. Uh, and there are tools and statistics which can help us do that. So in particular, propensity scoring or important sampling. And uh, we've started looking at some of those. But in addition to focusing on just accuracy, I think uh, algorithms or, or sorry, loss functions in the extreme scenario should also reward predicting rare or novel items. And that will work well in some applications, but in some applications you might want diversity. So in some applications, it's important to have a little bit of the head in there as well, right? Because that's where you generate most of your revenue. Or in some situations, you might, you might want to have a mix of your head and tail. And then finally, at least particularly in the recommendation scenario, you might want to reward algorithms that are explainable or that they, if they can explain why they made a certain set of recommendations to you, you might trust them more. So I think this is a fascinating uh, uh, research area. There are a lot of open research questions uh, over here that might not exist at, at, in the traditional setting. And I'd love to discuss these with you or, or if, if there's any interest, share code or data or talk to you more about them. So uh, that's my pitch, and uh, thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions. Uh, let me just answer Anandan's point quickly about whether the optimization is more important or uh, the loss function is more important. So one of these is uh, variance of uh, fast XML, I think. Yeah. yeah. Small data sets. Right. So if you look at this, right, what we did is we can take NDCG and put it in MLRF, right? So you, the optimization is not going to be the alternating minimization. It's going to be the standard random forest uh, optimization where you sample features randomly, do a sweep, pick the single best feature. So you can see that um, in most of the results, MLRF optimized, uh, optimizing NDCG does not do well. At the same time, you also said, okay, what happens if you take fast XML and restrict it to optimizing precision at five or NDCG at five, which I was uh, mentioning to Chris earlier, that also doesn't do well. So I would think that not only is um, optimizing NDCG important uh, rather than Gini index or entropy, but it is also important to optimize it, learn a full hyperplane and, and, and do the alternating minimization. Uh, other questions? I had a, I mean, a question or a comment or I, I don't know, just a topic that I'm. So I think that. Uh, um, um, so first of all, I think it's, the work is great. I think you glanced over one important thing, which is kind of subtle, and maybe that's why. But you kind of passed over it as if it doesn't exist. So I want to just ask you what you think about it. So when you talk about this setting, you can talk about one of two scenarios. One is where you have a very big but fixed set of labels, mm -hmm. and now the training set asymptotes to infinity. So now we can think about it as a standard machine learning question, only with the constant number of labels being very, very big. But all of our theory, all of our understanding, all of our intuition still works out well. And I think the example you gave is you said, well, let's look at the labels given in Wikipedia, and let's use those to label the entire internet. So we'll, we'll freeze Wikipedia at one point in time. We have many, many labels, but it's fixed. And now the web keeps growing and growing in asymptotes to infinity, and we can apply our standard statistical tools and understanding of machine learning. 
If you had given a slightly different example, if you had said, listen, let's use the labels in Wikipedia and label new Wikipedia pages that come in, now you would have fallen into the trap because now you have two things going to infinity. One is the number of labels and the other is the data set size and they are going together to infinity. So every new Wikipedia page appears with new labels. So the label set grows almost, you know, perhaps at the same rate as your training data grows. So, the, so again, sample size and number of labels both grow at the same rate. And now all existing machine learning theory goes out the window and many things that you kind of took for granted here, you know, you were focusing on doing it faster, doing it better, so on. Now all bets are off, you have to start from scratch. And it, and it seems like, I don't know, maybe you were saying that this will work in both scenarios. Yes, so... Um, there is, I see no reason why it should work in the lab. So, uh, I'm not a theory guy. So, theoretically, things might really go down in a basket. In fact, that's a great way for you to come in and help me prove some theorems about what is happening, right? Practically, we've observed uh, two things. One is, um, as new labels come in, um, both in the tree setting and in the um, embedding setting, which is for our NIPS paper, you can always take new labels and add them to the leaf nodes of the trees or embed them into the common space, that you're, the, the, the CCA space, the low rank matrix factorization. In either case, new labels as they come in simply get uh, inserted into the problem and now you can predict them. And uh, the guys at Google, Sami Benjo, Jason Weston have been doing this for a number of years now. So if you go back to the zero short learning setting, you can, new label came in, you just propagate it around your tree, figure out which leaf node there is in, you update the leaf node distribution. Um, in the extreme uh, uh, multi-class setting, John Langford has been working on these long trees so there's online learning, points are coming in as a fashion, and the trees are grown as the data points come in. And again, you can apply similar kinds of things. So John actually has theorems showing uh, at least some, that his trees will be balanced and stuff. I don't think he has a guarantee for uh, like statistical guarantees. And that's actually a really interesting theory question, right? How do you even give statistical guarantees at this scale? What does it mean for me to have a million labels. Like what, what is the complexity of this space? I could take a one label and replicate it a million times. But that doesn't mean I have a million label problem, right? And as you were pointing out, the way the label space goes to infinity might be really interesting. So I think there are really new theoretical uh, research questions over here. What is the dimensionality of the ambient label space? How do I give statistical guarantees? That I would love for theory people to work on. Some theory work has recently started coming out. So at ICML, there was a workshop on this, which I'm told by the organizers was very successful. They say that it was the second most attended workshop after deep learning. I think there's a big curve, right? 600 for deep learning and 100 or 200 for you. So what they were saying was, let's say I'm going to take a uh, Hamming loss and, and optimize that uh, using one versus all or whatever standard techniques I have. But now suppose I have to do efficient predictions, so I'm going to construct the tree. Well, how much worse will my Hamming loss be? Can I give a bound on that as compared to the Hamming loss over the entire one versus all of it? So I think there are lots of new questions coming out. Uh, you should just put them up on the slide. If people are interested in working on them, I'd be very happy to chat and discuss. So. Let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.